CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... ominous omnibus that stops at all stations of the Outre and the Macabre. Much that I sought, I could not find. Much that I found, I could not bind. Much that I bound, I could not free. Much that I freed, returned to me. And what is the poet telling us? That, practically speaking, in the end... It will all be as it was in the beginning. And so, therefore, it's not what you think you accomplished, but how good a run you got for your money. Some folks get a better run than others, don't they? I'm sorry, Doctor, I can't trust you. If you can't trust me, Mr. Bell, I cannot treat you. I have a great many enemies, powerful, wealthy enemies. How do I know you won't sell them my secrets? Because I am a doctor. And I have my code of ethics. Yeah, I suppose someone would say to you, let me look at Harry Bell's file. I'm willing to pay you very well. What would you say? I would refuse. And if he said, I'll give you a million dollars? I would still refuse. Has anybody ever actually offered you a million dollars? No. Well, then don't be so quick to answer. <laughs> mystery drama, The Paradise Cafe, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Court Benson. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Consider primitive man who cowered in a cave, who literally trembled at every falling leaf who saw himself surrounded on every side by malevolent spirits. Even the gods to whom he prayed were capricious and fickle. That was primitive, ignorant, undeveloped man. But why do we have similar problems? We sophisticated, modern, civilized beings. Primitive man went to a priest who would read his fate in the entrails of a goat. We go to a priest who tries to read our destiny by probing into, beneath, and beyond our mind. Of course, we don't call him a priest. We call him doctor. I, I don't know how to explain this. Maybe it can't be explained, but... Yes? I, uh... Oh, it's one thirty. I... I've got to use your phone to call my office. I am sorry. I don't think you should make a telephone call. Now look, Doctor, you don't understand. A multi-million dollar deal is involved here. Some people from Chicago are arriving you and You have I... asked me for one hour of my time to discuss a certain very serious problem, Mr. Bell. But I have to leave instructions for you my... You have already wasted half of it. It's crazy. Yes? I mean, what's happening to me? It's... It's crazy. How do you define crazy? Look, I went to the library. You know why? Oh, how could you know? I went to look up what they had to say about possession. Do you know what possession is? In what sense? Well, I wanted to see if it was possible, if it, if it was possible for something or someone to... to take possession of another person. Okay. Now I've told you. And that's a tape recorder playing, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. You can ruin me. Ruin you? How? How? You could make that tape public. You could play it for the board of directors of my corporation, to some of the banks I have to deal with, to certain other parties. All they'd have to do is hear that. As a physician, I am prohibited by both law and ethics from revealing... Don't hand me that. Every man, every woman has his price. 
I don't care who or what you think you are. You can be had. Do you know how much money's involved here? Money? Yes, money. <laughs> what do you know about money? Give me that tape recorder. Oh, what purpose? I want to erase that tape. If you don't trust me, I can't be your doctor. Well, I trust you. But you're going to erase the tape. Now we press this erase button. Mr. Bell, I'm afraid our session is over. Look, I trust you, understand, but you see, I, I know I'm being watched. Why do you say that? Well, I'm in my position. It would take my word for it. So it's discovered I'm seeing a shrink. No offense intended to the usage of the expression. So they figure... They? Who is they? I'll take my word for it. I got more days than I can handle. So they figure, what's he telling the shrink? We ought to know. And so they offer you a million bucks. I told you, my records are not for sale. What are you giving me slogans? Did anybody ever offer you a million dollars? Why did you come here? Well, it's... On, on account of this possession thing. Yes. Well, it's that simply somebody, something is, is taking possession of me, taking over. Is it happening now? No. No, because right now I'm fighting it. When I think about it, I can fight it off. But I can't keep thinking all the time. So it, it sneaks in and takes over. And, and even when I do think, it gets harder and harder because this, this thing gets stronger and stronger. How does this uh, possession manifest itself? It it makes me different. In what way? Well, it makes me feel different, think different, act different. Last night, all of a sudden, I take a cab down to the opera house and I go to the opera. Now, why would I want to go to the opera? Don't you like music? Oh, not that kind of music. And that's not the point. All I'm saying is, all of a sudden, I have to go to the opera. And I sit through it, too. Something made me stay. How can you describe this something? Well, I'm trying to tell you. It's, it, it's like I'm somebody else. Doing things, saying things, thinking things. El Xanadu did Kubla Khan, a stately pleasure dome decree. Yes. Why did I say that? Well, tell me. Where did that come from? I don't even know what it means. But you heard it somewhere. You read it somewhere. Never. It's a fragment of a poem by Coleridge. Well, I never heard of him either. But you must have read or studied that poem in high school. And I never went to high school. In Xanadu, did Kubla Khan, stately pleasure dome decree... Where off the sacred river ran through caverns measureless to man. Stop it! Stop it, Mr. Bell. Huh. That's what he or she, what it was saying inside me, through me. That wasn't me. It was my voice, but it wasn't me. No, I want you to lean back in your chair and relax. No, wait a minute. Not until I make this phone call. But Mr. Bell. My life depends on it. You doctors. A lot of things you don't understand. You can say relax, relax, but... Hello? Marguerite? Yeah, uh, The people show up yet. Well, tell them, uh, tell them... Uh, we cannot go through with the deal... Yeah, that's right. I, I'm aware of the problems. But I, I'm forced to cancel the deal. I'm, I'm afraid they'll have to do their worst. Did you hear what I just said? It wasn't me saying that. It wasn't. Because you know what I just did? I just signed my own death warrant. When I said cancel that deal, I asked for it. You mean you will die because of a business deal? Doctor, people like you know very little about the world. 
I mean the real world. Money. That's what it's about, money. Money, the winding sheet of the human race. There, there. He's talking again. That isn't me. And the cancellation of this deal will result in your death? Why? Because certain people won't go for it. Please, Doctor. Get rid of this thing for me. Get rid of it? Don't you turn me down. I'll pay you whatever you ask. Look, I'm a hard guy, sure, sure. I'm considered a legit businessman, but the the rumors are true. I got the rackets behind me, and I use the rackets, too. But you have to save me. My life is on the line. But if it is as simple as telling your secretary that the deal is still on, just tell her. I can't. He won't let me. Whoever he is, he won't let me. How is he stopping you? There is the phone. Reach for it. It's more than that. It has to do with... with... space. Space? Yeah, kind of open space and fresh air and... and kids. You know what I mean? No. Kids playing. You see, the deal's going to kill that. The deal's going to have a lot of factories. We bought up all that land because we knew they were going to build a turnpike alongside. What are you saying? We own the chairman of the state committee on highways. What am I talking about? We practically own the whole legislature. Look, it's 12 o'clock noon. The Chicago guys will be in at one shop. I have to be able to tell them the deal is on. Do you understand? Mr. Bell, I would advise a period of complete rest. You're doing it again. You're talking to me as if I'm a nut. Somebody's inside me. Get him out. Get him out by one o'clock. Relax. Don't resist anyone or anything. Whoever it is inside you, let him or it take over. Just yield. But I have to fight. Later, when we find out who. Now, relax. Let your mind feel free. Weave a circle around him thrice. And close thine eyes in holy dread. For he on honeydew hath fed and drunk the milk of paradise. (laughs) That isn't me. I never heard that before in my life. Think of those words that had just come out of your mouth. Do any of them mean anything to you? No. Weave a circle? Anything about weaving circles? No, no. Price, the number three. Close your eyes. Are you afraid of blindness? No. Holy dread. Are you afraid? Sure, I'm afraid. I'm scared stiff. Honeydew has felt. Honeydew is a melon that don't mean a thing. And drunk the milk of paradise? Milk? No. Paradise? No. I don't know what approach I can possibly... Well, wait, wait. Paradise. Yes? Paradise. What about paradise? I'm I'm trying to think. Oh, I know, I know. The cafe. The cafe, paradise. The paradise cafe, yeah. They tore the place down about 15 years ago. Paradise Cafe. The Paradise Cafe. Yeah, he used to come in there and recite poems. Who? Uh, This guy, uh, uh, Stanley. Stanley Mason. Stanley Mason? Yeah, a nutty kind of a guy. He used to hang around. He was sweet on Helen. Who was Helen? She was the waitress in the Paradise Cafe before they tore it down. And before... And before? Before what? Before I killed her. At this point, you know as much as we do. Harry Bell, a wealthy, if notorious, operator, is in the office of psychiatrist Maria Kluger, and he claims that he is being possessed. Something, someone, is inside him making him do things alien to his nature. 
and preventing him from doing something that could be a matter of life and death. To develop this story, we need a second act, and I shall be back with it in just a few moments. The best-known line in the hit play of the London stage in the year 1697 was, Possession is worth 11 points in the law. Possession. Well, when you own the body of another person, that's called slavery. When you own his soul, what name can we give that? But can you own the soul of another human being and speak for him, think for him, act for him? It seems to be happening to Mr. Harry Bell. Well, we have you and a man named Stanley and the waitress Helen in the Paradise Cafe. Yeah, I remember. And you murdered Helen? Uh, that doesn't go past this office. Why did you murder her? Because it... I didn't murder her. But you said that you... I killed her. But there is a difference. Oh, oh, yeah, sure. Tell me how it happened. Well, uh, Helen, she was kind of, you know, built. Everybody wanted to take her out. But she was a smart little thing. Well, anyhow, we were sitting around one night... Helen, thy beauty is to me like those Nician barks of yours, the gently or a perfumed sea, the weary, wayworn wanderer aboard to his own native shore. You don't say. That's by Edgar Allan Poe. Well, is that a fact? What ever happened to this other guy, Kubla Khan? He given the night off? Coleridge. I may be in a minority, but I place Coleridge with the major poet. No kidding. You hear that, Helen? I don't know when I've ever been so thrilled in all my life. Although his time was during the highly romantic period, he was curiously modern. Oh, this is news to me. Well, he was very much concerned with pollution. For example, in his poem, Cologne, about the highly industrial German city, he says, The river Rhine, it is well known, doth wash your city of Cologne. But tell me, nymph, what power divine shall henceforth wash the river Rhine? Hey, Stanley, did you ever figure a way to make a buck out of all these poems? Mm, true, poets have always been involved with the beauties of nature. But Coleridge is the first to be concerned with man's attacks on the basic environment. Oh, Helen, there's a concert tomorrow night. A free concert, I'll bet. In the park. Are you kidding? It's more than a concert, it's an opera. Oh, that lets me out. But it's really a very funny opera. Mm, I'd rather see the Marx Brothers. This is called The Barber of Seville. The Barber of Seville, Doctor. The Barber of Seville. That was the opera I went to see last night. Yes. Why did I go? Why did I sit through it? Tell me more about the Paradise Cafe and why you murdered Helen. I didn't murder her. It was an accident. Tell me. Well, Stanley would always... Try to make time with Helen. But he was going about it all wrong. He was throwing this crazy poetry at her. Yes, each man kills the thing he loves. By each, let this be heard. Some do it with a bitter look. Some with a flattering word. The coward does it with a kiss. The brave man with a sword. Put another nickel in the jukebox, Stanley. And give us a rest, will you? Helen. You're going to order something, Stanley? Well, then, beat it. But, Helen... Get lost, please. Oh, that'd roll off his back. He'd come back for more night after night. You know what I mean? <laughs> Some guys. I never learn. One night, we're in the place. Oh. Helen's busy with some other customers. So I said to Stanley... Hey, Stanley. That's not the way to score with a dame. Score? I don't think you understand, Harry. Huh? What don't I understand? I'm in love with Helen. Oh, sure. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> love? 
Not your kind of love, Harry. Ah, get wise, Stanley. There are guys taking Helen out, guys who spend a couple of bucks. You want to make time? Take go. I don't believe it. What do you believe, Stanley? Can't answer, can you? <laughs> you know why? Because you're not money. Only money talks today. Everything else is just idle chatter. You really believe that, don't you? Oh, indeed, I do. I really and truly and honestly do. Oh, money. The winding sheet of the human race. Well, whatever it is, without it, you're dead. Guess who Helen's going out with tomorrow night? Me. You? I don't believe it. Why not? Because you're... Harry, you're quite ordinary. And Helen is a is an unusual, a most unusual human being. Yeah, yeah. You think so? Well, here she comes now, Stanley. Just watch this. Observe the old master in action. Well, here's the two freeloaders. She walks in beauty, like the night. Uh, Helen, what are you doing tomorrow night? Why, what do you have in mind? Well, for starters, dinner at Laricio's. Laricio's? You know what it costs you to tip the hat trick out, Laricio's? Yeah, I do. Afterwards, we'll go to the Trotters, lay a few bucks on the several nags. We'll wind up with some supper and dancing at the Chesterfield Club. You <laughs> must be not here in family. <laughs> uh, that may be or not. Meanwhile, I have to make my arrangements for the evening, so uh, what's the answer? No, where would you get the kind of dough for a night like that? Well, in my pocket. Here, take a look. <laughs> Yeah, it's not a 20 covering a roll of ones, either. This is solid all the way, baby. Oh, what's that? Well, I developed a green thumb. No, tell him no. Hey, Stanley. Listen, Chris. Tell him no. Don't go out with him. He doesn't love you. He doesn't even respect you. Get out of here, because I, I have you thrown out. If you go with him, you'll regret it. Oh, take off. You'll pay for it. Stanley, I think you heard the young lady. I'm warning you. Stanley, you're making a scene. There are people in the place. You'll be sorry for the rest of your life. Well, he finally ran out of there. People looked at him as if he was a nut, which he was. Several questions. First, where did you get the money? Well, that was the year I learned. You see, I knew you had to have money. But how did you get it? Carry a gun and steal ads for chumps. You can say I learned how to put certain people together with certain other people, or with things they needed, or both. That was the year I began. I learned that if people think you have money, they come to you. And they've been coming ever since. And when did you murder Helen? It wasn't murder. Whatever it was. When did it happen? That night. That night we made the rounds. Dinner, the races, dancing, supper. Yeah, we kept going. But finally I took her home. Oh, it was a great evening, Harry. Yeah, sure was. I really enjoyed yeah, it. Yeah, so did I, so did I. Well, good night. Uh, good night? Wait, what's with this good night? Oh, no, uh, just a minute, Harry. Well, I'm coming in. No, uh, Harry. Good night. What do you think this Harry, is? Harry, please, I, I'm, I'm really very tired. And... Well, if you're tired, you can drink a cup of coffee. Harry, I'm just going to have to ask you to leave. And what do you think you got here? A, a sucker like Stanley? You know how much dough I went for tonight? 280 bucks. But, Harry, we can go out again? And all I'm going to get for my 280 is good night at the door. Harry, I like you. I, I like you very much. It, it's just that... Oh, no, Harry, baby, I... no. Harry, you don't make a trouble no, out of no, Harry, no, not keep, you. Keep away from me, please. Uh, oh, Harry, Harry doesn't mind please. going for the dough, but that's got to be a payoff. Keep away from me. Come on over here, Harry, baby. I... No. Come over no. here. Put that back down. You'll hurt yourself. Keep away. No. I think keep away. No. <laughs> this bowl of fruit. She had on the table, and there was a knife. She picked it up, and she came at me with it, and I, I tried to knock it out of her hand. And 
Well, I, I had to hit her. I mean, it was self-defense. And I hit her. But I hit her very hard. And she fell over kind of hard, too. And she hit her head against the table. I, I, I can't remember. Anyhow, it... Well, that's what killed her. She was dead. Yeah. All of a sudden, she was dead. And then, what did you do? I'm telling you this. But you try to peddle it to anybody and I'll make you look like a trump. What did you do? Well, that was the year I guess I grew up. It was the year I became the kind of guy I am today. And what kind of guy is that? I learned the key to it all. Never use your own money. What does that mean? Always have someone else pay for you. Stanley? Stanley. But how could you get Stanley? Uh, You can arrange anything if you know how. I looked down at her body. I said to myself, the very least I can hope for here is manslaughter. And that's at least five years away. Ah... Let Stanley serve the time. He's not doing anything anyhow. So I went over to Stanley's little furnished room. <laughs> I had to wake him up. Oh, Harry, do you know what time it yeah, is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, listen, she wants you. Who does? Well, who do you think? Helen. But she went out with you. Yeah, yeah, I know. It, it, it was a mistake, Stanley. We, we both knew it was a mistake. We spent the whole time just talking about you. Uh, at least Helen did. Helen? Yeah. She's in her apartment. Crying her eyes out. She She is? She, she wants you to forgive her, Stanley. Forgive her? Of course. Go there and tell her. Now? Now? Stanley, you, you got to make the moves. Come on, she needs you. Don't you understand? Oh, oh of course I understand. I... I knew, I knew that deep down I could possess her. She would be mine. I would possess her soul with patience. She's mine. She's all yours. Go and get her. 19th Precinct, Sergeant Sloan. Uh, Sergeant, uh, I hope it's a false alarm, but... I happen to pass my uh, 221 Collier Place. And uh, I'm, I'm sure I heard a woman screaming. You know, as if she was being murdered or something. You say the address is 221 Collier? But I... I didn't do it, officer. I didn't do it. Hey, you'll have to come along with us, Mr. Mason. But she was dead. She was already dead when I got here. Sergeant, you have to believe me. It uh, doesn't matter if I believe you or not, Mr. Mason. Your problem is going to be with a judge and a jury. As you have already guessed, he's going to have quite a problem. But that's why we're here to give people problems and to permit them to work out the solutions. And sometimes we discover that the solution can be even more of a problem than the original problem, which is where we are heading in Act Three. complicated plans that usually founder and sink in the stormy seas of reality. Therefore, keep it simple. Simple the way Harry Bell kept it simple. You want somebody else to pay for a murder that you have just committed? Don't get involved in complicated machinations. Just arrange to have your patsy in position when the police arrive. You'd be surprised how swiftly nature takes its course. And so, Mr. Bell, you framed Stanley Mason for the murder. That happens every day. People are framed for murder every day. People pay heavy prices for other people. But to make poor Stanley pay the price for you... Why not? Why not? 
Do I have to explain it to you? No, I have to explain it to you, Dr. Kluger. You see, that's why Stanley was born. To pay for your crime? He was born to be a fall guy. You see, I did a lot of reading. No formal education, maybe, but I did a lot of reading. And I've been around. Did you ever hear the expression, nature hates a vacuum? The word is abhorse. But we needn't quibble. Yeah. Well, just understand the point. Where there's a need, it gets filled. There's a need in this world for suckers, fall guys. And so nature supplies them. You see what I mean? Stanley was born to be a fall guy. And what happened to Stanley? Well, I lost control of that situation. How? Well, I didn't think he'd get the chair. In those days, they still had the death penalty. And, well, they used to hand it out, too. Anyhow, I, I thought it would be manslaughter or a murder in the second or third. But I forgot. The D.A. could establish premeditation. But you did intend to murder Helen Walker. No. The witnesses who have just testified here, are they lying? Isn't it true that you were insanely jealous? Well, I... Uh, I was jealous, yes. And when you I... heard that Helen Walker was going out with Mr. Harry Bell, didn't you threaten her? No, no. You didn't say, and I quote the witnesses, you'll regret it, you'll pay for it, you'll be sorry for the rest of your life? Yes, yes, I said it, but what I meant was she would lose her self-respect. She she would lose her, her freshness, her, her ideals. She would sell herself for money, and that's why she would regret. That's how she would pay. That's why she would be sorry for the rest of her life. You deny that you killed Helen Walker. How could I kill her? I loved her. When the police officers entered the apartment, there was blood on your hands. Of course. She was lying on the floor. I I tried to lift her, and there was blood on, if on, you on her. you didn't kill her, what were you doing there at that hour of the night? I told you. I went there because Harry Bell came to me and said she wanted to see me. And when I got there, she... She was... She was dead. Mr. Bell, you had gone out with Miss Helen Walker. Yes. And had she ever mentioned anything about Stanley Mason's threat? Uh, well, um... Mr. Bell, you're under oath. Well, well it's... Just that I didn't think Stanley was that type of guy. What type of guy? Well, the type that could kill. But, uh... But? Well, but nothing. I, I don't want to say any more. You left Helen Walker at her apartment at about what time? About a quarter after two a.m. Where did you go from there? Home. You went right home. You didn't stop off to see Stanley Mason? Well, why would I stop off to see Stanley Mason? He says you did. Oh, I'm sorry. It isn't true. He's lying. He's lying. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, what are the simple but stubborn facts? We have the defendant who is obsessed by a passion for poor Helen Walker. He became violently jealous when she agreed to a date with Mr. Harry Bell. He threatened her. He came to her apartment late that night and killed her. He was found in her apartment and her blood on his hands. The state rests its case. I'm innocent. I tell you, I'm innocent. I loved her. I... Still love her. The jury was back in an hour, Doctor. I, I think they could have come back in 15 minutes. Guilty. First degree. No recommendation for clemency. The judge passed sentence. Stanley was dead three months later. And you just let it happen. Well, by this time it was a snowball rolling downhill. It was getting too big. I was going too fast to stop. And your conscience never bothered you? Conscience? I used to have one. And then I heard something Stanley said. And thus doth conscience make cowards of us all. And I knew what that meant right off the bat. 
There are things that you have to do, and when you're too scared to do them, you blame it on your conscience. Would it have been better for me to have gone to the chair instead of Stanley? To have died instead of Stanley? But Stanley isn't dead. Oh, he's dead all right. Stanley's wrapped in his coffin and buried in his grave. He lives in you. In me? Yes. He has taken possession of you. Oh, look. That's for primitive people, for ignorant, superstitious people. This possession business. Oh, I know that's what I spoke about earlier, but that's not why I came to you. You're a doctor. You're a psychiatrist. You don't believe. You can't believe in that kind of... Or do, do you? I can only believe the evidence. Do you realize it's, it's one o'clock? The Chicago people are already in town. They know I've said no to the deal. They'll kill me. They'll have to. They'll make it look like an accident, but with me out of the picture, they can get the boats to carry it through. Carry what through? The project. See, we're going to build these plants right near superhighways, an airport, railroad. But I, I thought it could make up in a wonderful children's summer camp. Who thought? I told you, I thought. Where would Harry Bell get such thoughts? That's how Stanley Mason would think. What's wrong with you, Doc? Don't I know how important it is for kids to have a camp? I was brought up in a slum. You are now Stanley Mason. Are you crazy? You are Stanley Mason. Because you want to be Stanley Mason. (laughs) Me? I want to be a creep like Stanley why? Because your conscience has made a coward of you. I told you I don't have one. You killed Helen Walker. You made Stanley pay for it. And now your conscience is exacting the price. <laughs> you remember everything Stanley ever said. And you have become Stanley. It's a lie. Prove it. Pick up the telephone. Call your office and say what Harry Bell would say. Say the deal is going through. That is what Harry Bell would decide, isn't it? Well, why can't you do it? Because I... Yes, I'm waiting. The words won't come out. Because Stanley Mason won't permit them. A children's camp sounds like a much better idea than a cluster of factories. <laughs> You've got to get rid of Stanley for me. Stanley seems a much finer person than Harry. That's not for you to judge. Well, that's true. And yet, if Stanley has succeeded in transferring his ideals to you, society will certainly be the gainer. But I'll be the loser. Why? I'll be killed. I can't protect myself. I have heard of stories of possession by demons, evil spirits, but this is the first time a benign presence has... It's his revenge. Stanley's revenge. When did you first start feeling Stanley's presence? Oh, I... I don't... I think it was... when this project came up. Well... There was a lot of fuss raised against it, you know, do-gooders, extremist cranks. I didn't pay any attention. You sure? Yeah, I'm sure. Besides, that's all noise. But then some other money got interested in... What other money? I'll deny I ever said this. Bracket money. And if I pull out on these fellas, send flowers. Excuse me. Yes? I know. What's that? Oh, thank you. My receptionist. First, this appointment has run way past schedule. I'll buy you a whole day. A gentleman is waiting for you in the outer office. For me? Yes. He said to tell you he was your Chicago colleague. The guy's going to kill me. Here? Yeah. Shall I call the police? It won't be here. It won't be anything the police will ever suspect. I want to suspect. Mr. Bell, 
You have a devil, or I should say, an angel in possession of you. Only you can exorcise him. Can't you do anything? What could be more simple than saying, the deal is on? Four little words. Four little one-syllable words. Common, everyday words. That is your solution. That is your exorcism. That drives out Stanley Mason. Uh, we let you go, Lohan, here. In here? What a chump I am. I'm going to let Stanley bust up my mind. <laughs> you insist. Miss Pendleton, have Mr. Bell's colleague come in, please. Yes, Miss Pendleton, I know I'm running late. All right, I feel like I'm Stanley on the run. How do you think he ever got inside me in the first place? Wait. It might have been something that Jerry Lane said. Who was it? Jerry Lane? Yeah. This guy from Chicago. Oh, uh, hello, Jerry. Harry. Uh, Jerry, this is Dr. Kluger. My pleasure. Your nurse said to come in. Uh, please, sit down. Oh, what is this, Harry? You under the weather? <laughs> no. No, no, I'm fine now. I heard some uh, very puzzling news. Uh, he... Yeah, well, we we can talk here. Oh, I mean, uh, about the project. Yeah. What'd you hear? Well, that you were having second thoughts. Well, that's to be expected. So much is involved. There's been a big fuss, really. Oh, that always happens. But what do I keep telling you? By the time we get finished, you work that little magic of yours, why, the whole thing will smell like cologne. Ain't that what I kept saying? Smell like cologne. Cologne. The River Rhine. It is well known to wash thy city of cologne. But tell me, nymphs, what power divine shall henceforth wash the River Rhine? What are you talking about? It's not me. It's not me. It's Stanley. Stanley Mason. Hey, Doctor, what's the matter with him? The spoilers, destroyers, the faces. they gone with ice smog and ice smell. For earth must be made into heaven while thou wouldst convert it to hell. Doctor, what's wrong? <laughs> only, <laughs> the only thing I can think of, <laughs> he is possessed. You may have read of a tycoon who disappeared. As a matter of fact, it was a memorable headline. Tycoon disappears in typhoon. Mr. Harry Bell was washed off his yacht during a storm at sea. Some say it was a convenient disappearance because his financial empire had collapsed. The truth may be in the files of Dr. Maria Kluger, but... Ethically, morally, and legally, she cannot say a word on the subject. I'll return shortly. Revenge. The revenge of an evil man is to bring evil in the expectation that evil will kill his hated enemy. What is the revenge of a good man? Since evil is inimical to his character, he can only perform good. Can you kill a person by filling him with goodness? You just heard it happen. It proves that there are more things on heaven and earth than are dreamed of in anyone's philosophy. And we get around to most of them right here seven times each week. Our cast included Court Benson, E.V. Juster, William Redfield, and Len Gotchman. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.